Often in medicine, patients present with signs and symptoms that can lead to broad differential diagnoses. Aside from gathering an accurate history, focusing on a specific clinical data may be helpful in narrowing the differential. A 34-year-old South Asian man presented to a hospital with a one-month history of constant diffuse abdominal pain, fatigue and anorexia associated with weight loss. He reported constipation, but no diarrhea, bloody stools, fevers or night sweats. The differential diagnosis of subacute diffuse abdominal pain is broad. It includes inflammatory conditions such as celiac disease, malignancy, obstruction, a hepatic or biliary pathologic condition, pancreatitis, adrenal insufficiency, infection, metabolic causes such as acute intermittent porphyria, and as a diagnosis of exclusion, functional causes. The patient had lived in Canada since he was 13. His medications included gabapentin, ibuprofen, and acetaminophen with codeine, all of which had been prescribed for his pain. He denied using nicotine-containing products, alcohol, or recreational drugs. The patient's vital signs were normal at presentation. On physical exam, he appeared thin with conjunctival pallor. The jugular venous pressure was one centimeter above the sternal angle. His abdominal exam showed mild tenderness in the left lower quadrant with no rebound tenderness, guarding, fluid wave, masses, or organomegaly. Bowel sounds were normal. The jugular venous pressure suggests volume depletion which could be a manifestation of the underlying condition causing his abdominal pain or a consequence of the pain. Let's look at the lab results to get more information. Laboratory studies showed low levels of hemoglobin, hematocrit, and mean corpuscular volume. He did not have iron deficiency. A peripheral blood smear showed occasional nucleated red blood cells and basophilic stippling. AST and ALT levels were mildly elevated as was his gamma-GT level. Alkaline phosphatase, bilirubin and LDH levels were normal. Renal function tests, electrolytes, thyrotropin, serum vitamin B12, CRP, INR and APTT were also normal. CT of the abdomen showed thickening of the rectum and sigmoid colon near the hepatic flexure with a normal appearing terminal ileum and no lymphadenopathy. The abnormalities on CT warrant endoscopic investigation. The patient's labs are notable for a microcytic anemia with immature red blood cells, basophilic stippling, and mildly abnormal liver enzymes. The patient's elevated levels of ferritin, iron, and transferrin saturation are not consistent with iron deficiency. The normal CRP level makes an inflammatory cause of anemia less likely, although it does not rule it out. In a patient of South Asian ancestry, thalassemia should be considered as an explanation of the microcytic anemia. However, that would not explain his abdominal pain. Basophilic stippling in red blood cells is suggestive of impaired erythropoiesis and is associated with conditions such as lead and arsenic poisoning, sideroblastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, and thalassemia. It would be worthwhile to measure the blood lead level since lead poisoning can cause microcytic anemia with basophilic stippling and abdominal pain. Serologic tests for HIV, hepatitis A, B, and C viruses should also be performed, given the patient's transaminitis. The patient was admitted to the hospital for further investigation. Upper and lower endoscopy revealed normal appearing mucosa with no bleeding or inflammation. Ultrasonography of the liver revealed diffuse fatty infiltration. The patient was given morphine to relieve his pain and discharged home with pantoprazole. After discharge, the gastric biopsy specimens showed evidence of Helicobacter pylori infection. The remaining biopsy results were negative and hemoglobin electrophoresis was normal. The patient was started on lansoprazole, amoxicillin and clarithromycin without improvement in his symptoms. During the next six weeks, the patient made several more visits to the emergency department for persistent abdominal pain. He underwent a capsule endoscopy, a study involving a wireless pill with a camera to visualize the gastrointestinal tract, which was normal. He was readmitted to the hospital and noted to have lost an additional 11 kilograms of weight and had a new right-sided headache with associated nausea but no photophobia or neck stiffness. 
Serologic tests were negative. Serum protein electrophoresis was not suggestive of plasma cell proliferative disease. The cerebrospinal fluid chemistry and cell counts were unremarkable. CSF, blood and urine cultures were negative. Chest radiography and MRI of the head and spine did not reveal significant findings. He was ultimately discharged home with an unclear diagnosis. Hepatic steatosis or fatty liver may explain this patient's transaminitis. His history of alcohol use should be reassessed, although it does not explain his persistent abdominal pain. Given the negative workup of his abdominal pain so far, rare diagnoses should be considered, such as acute intermittent porphyria, an inherited disorder of porphyrin metabolism. However, acute intermittent porphyria is not generally associated with anemia and typically consists of episodic abdominal pain. H. pylori infection does not explain this patient's anemia. The negative cultures and normal findings on CSF analyses further argue against infectious or inflammatory causes. When faced with a constellation of unexplained symptoms, it can be helpful to focus on an objective finding with a limited differential diagnosis. Microcytic anemia is one such finding. The evaluation thus far has ruled out both iron deficiency and thalassemia. Other remaining conditions on the differential that can cause microcytic anemia are sideroblastic anemia, an anemia due to defective protoporphyrin synthesis, lead poisoning, and copper deficiency. Lead and copper levels should be assessed. If the levels are normal, a bone marrow biopsy is warranted. One week later, the patient returned to the hospital after experiencing a generalized seizure. Despite medication to abort seizures, his seizures continued to recur with interictal somnolence requiring intubation and transfer to the ICU. No fevers or neurologic focal deficits were noted. CT of the head was unremarkable. Urine drug screening was positive for opioids, which was consistent with his known use of prescribed opioids. Serum ethanol was undetectable. Testing continued to show microcytic anemia and a normal C-reactive protein level. His liver enzyme levels were now normal. Bone marrow biopsy and aspirate showed normal trilineage hematopoiesis with occasional ring sideroblasts, which are red cells with excess iron, and no evidence of myelodysplasia or a lymphoproliferative disorder. On hospital day 6, a critically elevated serum level of free protoporphyrin was reported. The bone marrow biopsy results rule out myelodysplastic syndrome. Acute intermittent porphyria can cause abdominal pain and seizures, but does not explain anemia or elevated protoporphyrin levels. An elevated free protoporphyrin level can be caused by lead poisoning. Occasionally, ring sideroblasts, nucleated red cell precursors with perinuclear rings of iron-laden mitochondria, can also be seen in patients with toxic levels of lead. We should return to the case to see what the patient's lead level is. The elevated serum level of free protoporphyrin, combined with the patient's abdominal pain, seizures, and laboratory evidence of microcytic anemia, was considered to be indicative of lead poisoning. The blood lead level returned markedly elevated at 94.4 microgram per deciliter. Common signs and symptoms of lead poisoning include gastrointestinal discomfort, constipation, and altered mental status, although the presentation is variable and depends on the duration of exposure. Clinical exam features may include bluish pigmentation at the gum line known as lead lines, hypertension, and peripheral neuropathy, although none of these signs are particularly sensitive for lead poisoning. Severe encephalopathy, which can include seizures, characteristically occur at a very high blood lead level, for example, greater than 100 micrograms per deciliter in adults. The long-term, low-level exposure, neurologic manifestations may be more insidious and can include memory impairment and irritability. Mild long-term elevations of the blood lead level of greater than 10 micrograms per deciliter are also associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, renal dysfunction, and neurocognitive effects, highlighting the need to avoid even low-level exposure. Now that the diagnosis of lead poisoning has been confirmed, it is important to identify the source in order to prevent ongoing exposure. A thorough occupational history should be taken, as well as an assessment of any potential environmental or home exposures. 
Although the patient had previously denied recreational drug use, on repeat history taking, he admitted to daily opium use for two years before his first hospitalization. He stopped using opium after that hospitalization and reported nausea, sweating and tremors as his withdrawal symptoms. Due to concerns that opium may be contaminated with lead, the patient was asked to produce a sample of opium for further testing. Fear of stigma often prevents patients from being forthcoming when asked about their substance use. At a minimum, this patient meets the criteria for a moderate opioid use disorder. Opioid agonist therapy with buprenorphine or methadone is recommended, along with psychosocial treatment, if desired. It should be noted that this patient had received several opioid prescriptions. These opioids would have treated any withdrawal symptoms, but also risk an unintentional overdose if he continued to use opium. Opium is the likely source of his lead poisoning. Lead poisoning associated with opium use has been described in several case reports globally. The reason for lead contamination in opium is not known, although there are hypotheses that suggest lead could be added to increase the weight and therefore increase profits, or that it is a result of the manufacturing process. A sample of the opium confirmed the presence of lead. The patient received chelation therapy with oral succimer for 18 days to rapidly lower lead levels. He was discharged home with buprenorphine and naloxone and was referred to community addiction support services. The patient's symptoms of abdominal and musculoskeletal pain, lethargy and anorexia abated rapidly. At subsequent follow-ups, his blood lead level had dropped and he remained abstinent from opium with continued treatment with buprenorphine and naloxone. Lead poisoning is an often overlooked diagnosis. Since the typical characteristics of abdominal pain and weight loss are not specific, a focus on the limited causes of microcytic anemia ultimately led to the diagnosis. After making a diagnosis of lead poisoning, it is imperative to identify the source to thwart further exposure. Another major takeaway is that in challenging cases without a clear unifying diagnosis, it is helpful to revisit the patient's history. Although substance use is an important routine part of history taking, Clinicians should recognize that patients may not always be forthcoming about recreational drug use. An earlier disclosure of this patient's substance use would have prevented unnecessary testing and led to earlier treatment. This case serves as another reminder that creating a safe and non-judgmental environment, especially regarding sensitive information, is a critical part of patient care. <laughs>